Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name's David Mackay. I'm the Chief Scientific Advisor at the Department of Energy and Climate Change, and I'm very pleased to be here introducing tonight's speaker. Before I do that, please could everyone ensure that you've switched off your mobile phones. And this event is being webcast live, and it's being recorded for our archives also. Our speaker tonight is Julian Allwood. Julian leads the Low Carbon and Materials Processing Research Group in the Department of Engineering at the University of Cambridge. His group focuses on the technologies and systems of energy, material, and resource efficiency. His group's current projects include exploration of material efficiency in metals, manufacturing, and use, the development of novel metal-forming processes, and the investigation of options for future carbon emissions reductions in consumer goods. In 2008, he was awarded a five-year EPSRC Leadership Fellowship to lead a major project on the global, global carbon emissions targets for steel and aluminium in collaboration with a consortium of 20 global companies. Since 2010, Julian has also served on Working Group 3 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And today, the Energy Minister and the Climate Change Minister, Greg Barker, announced that there will be five new university-based national centres on end-use energy reduction, and Julian is going to be one of the leaders at one of those centres. Finally, Julian is the author of a fine book uh, on sustainable materials, which has the same title as uh, today's lecture. It's called Sustainable Materials with Both Eyes Open, and he has kindly, with his co-authors, made this book available free online, and I highly recommend the book, and I've heard Julian speak multiple times, and I'm sure we're going to very much enjoy his lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Julian Al Allwood. Thank you very much, David, and thank you all for coming and giving up your evening. I don't know if, uh, like me, the word sustainability is beginning to get you down, but I'm beginning to feel that whenever we hear, hear the word sustainability, something slightly odd happens in our brains, because rather like warm Ugg boots or sweaters, they make us feel comfortable, but it doesn't lead us to taking any other action. And I think it's a word that we love talking about. When Gordon Brown got the idea of sustainability in 2007, he said that uh, now the UK was going to take climate change seriously and we were going to cut down on the use of carrier bags in supermarkets. Um, that's important. We, if we used less carrier bags, we would indeed emit a tiny amount less carbon, around about the same amount as if we drove one mile less per year. So he's right, it would make a difference, but it would make a very, very small difference. Um, the University of East Anglia had a research project a couple of years ago where they looked at public attitudes towards climate change. What would make a big difference? The number one activity is to recycle newspapers, according to the public. We love putting our papers in the bin as we fly off to Spain for the weekend. But the number two activity is to eat more organic eggs. Now, <laughs> that's very, very interesting there has been a university study saying that organic eggs do save 14% of the emissions of uh, normal eggs. But actually, the public has confused two completely unrelated issues. Animal welfare in farming and climate change have gone into the same bucket, which is this broad bucket of sustainability. Um, Jaguar Land Rover are taking it seriously, and if you buy... Uh, this vehicle, then as part of the purchase price, the, um, the carbon emissions of the first 45,000 miles are offset as part of the purchase price. So that's, uh, if you believe in carbon offsets, that's a very good thing. Um, however, if you really believed in climate change, maybe you wouldn't choose a 4.2 litre engine <laughs> able to accelerate a three-tonne car from 0 to 60 in four seconds, returning an average of 12 miles per gallon. Um, and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, they love the word sustainability because it allows them not to use the phrase carbon emissions. So they've got 30 indicators of sustainability, which includes important things like uh, the number of trees on the road going towards the cement plant, 
And they've concluded that they are making great progress on 29 of their indicators, so they are a truly sustainable intra industry. And I'll put that one up just as uh, one that I particularly enjoy. This is, in fact, not a commercial proposal. Uh, this is from uh, Private Eye. Uh, but it's worth just thinking that one through uh, as to when that would be an advantageous solution. Sustainability is something we actually really do care about. It really does matter. And we've somehow got to drag ourselves out of thinking about things that make a difference, but a difference that's so small it's not worth worrying about, into things that make a big enough difference. And particularly in the area of climate change, we've got an idea of what that might be. Um, I'm, uh, I've just got back from the most recent meeting of the IPCC last week, and I'm in the area which looks at mitigation strategies, but we had a report from the group that's looking at the science of climate change, and broadly it seems that what we'll find out when the first report is published next year is that the emissions since the last report are worse than the worst of all six scenarios that they considered. So uh, the problem that we're creating is getting worse far faster than we're taking any action about it, and therefore we've got to get some sense of scale. So I started thinking about scale in 2006, and worried firstly just about energy. If we start from global energy and we say, roughly speaking, carbon emissions come from combusting fuel to make energy, we want to halve emissions by the year 2050, how are we going to do it? Well, to do it, we need a map. And so we spent three years with uh, John Cullen, who worked uh, with me for his PhD, trying to come up with a picture that would help us to address that question. And we came up with two or three pictures, but the key one is this, which is a map of the way that the world uses energy. I want to spend a little bit of time on this because I think it's important about getting a sense of scale. Over here, we've got the sources of energy. Uh, the diagram is drawn according to the conventions of uh, William, uh, of, not William, of Captain Sankey, uh, where the thickness of the line is proportional to the strength of the flow, in this case, the flow in joules per year. Um, the three main sources, of course, are the fossil fuels, oil, gas, and coal. And we also use a lot of biomass globally. That's not to create biofuels. It's for cooking and heating in uh, developing countries. Um, and we have some nuclear and renewable energy. We then transform those energy sources into final energy. Obviously, about a third of it gets converted into electricity. Um, we then use that final energy in a device to create mechanical work, heat or cooling or light or communications. And then we exchange that final form of useful energy in a what we've called a system, in effect a piece of equipment, in order to get a service. So we, uh, a car takes the useful mechanical work that comes out of a diesel or petrol engine, turns it into low-grade heat, a small rise in the temperature of the atmosphere around the car, in exchange for the service of transport. And this has proved very helpful because we can start connecting things together. We can get a sense of scale about what makes a difference. We can also unpack some of the information that gets put around uh, rather falsely. Let's see if you can spot an error with the following statement. A third of the world's energy comes from oil. A third of the world's energy is used in electricity. A third of the world's energy is used in burners. A third of the world's energy is used in vehicles. A third of the world's energy is used in industry, and a third of the world's energy is used in buildings. Everything I've said is true, but, and if you work for McKinsey's consultancies take note, adding those things together, they would cease to be true because I've accounted for six-thirds of the world's energy supply. It's ever so easy to make mistakes when talking about what might make a difference to the energy system and the famous marginal abatement curves that McKinsey's and others use uh, assume that all options are additive. Well, of course they're not. You can only add them if they occur in the same vertical slice through the diagram. If you're moving horizontally, then you have to multiply them together to get the combined effect. One of the other things that we can do, though, with a diagram like this is that if we imagine printing it on a rubber sheet, we can start stretching it and thinking of it as a way of representing the future. So we know that by the year 2050, our demand for energy services will roughly double. Uh, the population is currently 7 billion. It'll move up to 9 billion. 
Uh, but more importantly, by 2050, the world middle class population, which is currently about 1 billion, will, we hope, expand to about 4 billion. That's something that we've worked towards having that economic development. But of course, the middle classes consume a lot more energy than uh, people at an early stage of, uh, in poverty. So we're assuming that energy, the demand for services from energy is going to double. So on the right-hand side of my rubber sheet, I'm going to stretch this out to a factor of two. Well, clearly, if I do nothing else at all, I'll also stretch out the left-hand side and carbon emissions will double. And as I said at the beginning, that's roughly the track that we're on at the moment. If we take no action, we're just going to keep increasing our emissions in proportion to our use of energy. But maybe we could find some other solutions. So one solution, which is much discussed, is to say, OK, let's, let's solve this. We're going to invest in our country in technology. We're going to find renewable supplies, and they'll take away the problem. Uh, renewables are currently 3% of the world's uh, energy supply. Nearly all of that comes from hydroelectricity. So if I want to double this side while halving coal, gas, and oil, I need to increase renewables by a factor of 50 um, I've got 38 years left to do that, and remember that nearly all of it's hydro at the moment, and it's pretty hard to expand hydro. Now, I think wherever you come from in your hopes or beliefs about renewables, it seems to me that we can say with some certainty that we're not going to manage to expand renewables output by a factor of 50 over the next 38 years. Nuclear is currently 6% of primary supply, so we'd only have to expand nuclear by a factor of 25 but as you know, what's happening at the moment is very different. Germany has ruled it out. Japan has shut down its nuclear reactors at the moment. And all the countries that have invested heavily in nuclear, their nuclear output is currently declining. So it's actually going to be rather difficult to solve the problem on the supply side. But that's what's had all the attention to date, because it would be terrific for all of us if we could find a magic substitute on the left which inserted new magic carbon-free energy into the system so we didn't have to change anything else. That would be great, but it's not there. I think it's very, very unlikely we're going to get a solution anywhere near the scale we think matters on the supply side. So that says that we need to look at energy demand, and this gives us a basis for doing that. I carefully use the phrase energy services when I talked on the right because there are other ways that we can provide these services. So there's a whole series of different ways that we can meet the demand of passenger transport without using as much flying and as many single-occupant cars as we do at the moment. Maybe we could make the whole system more efficient. But if you think about that, when we think about efficiency, we nearly always think about these engineering devices that convert useful energy or final fuels into useful energy. But then think about what Rolls-Royce have done, the business of Rolls-Royce, the aircraft engine manufacturer. For the last 50 years, their sole motivation, all 100,000 of them or how many there are, have come to work every day trying to get more power out of the same amount of fuel. That's been their entire reason to exist, and that's how they compete. So already for 50 years, 100,000 or how many people Rolls-Royce have involved have been trying to optimise the aircraft engine. And you can say the same about every one of these. Uh, all of these devices already have highly motivated people trying to make them efficient because that's how they make money. If the Formula One car companies could make more power out of petrol, they would have done it already because that's what they're entirely motivated to do. So efficiency here actually isn't a very good option either. And incidentally, electricity generation, I think we've almost all agreed implicitly that we're not going to get any more or very much more electricity out of coal and gas, again, because those companies are wholly motivated. So what I think is rather interesting about this is it forces us towards this section here of what I've called passive systems or equipment, equipment that itself doesn't convert energy but exchanges energy for a service. In a sense, you can think of a car as being a storage tank, if a car is moving at whatever speed we wish to travel, let's call it 50 miles per hour, then according to Newton's laws, I don't need any more energy to finish my journey. I've got enough, except for losses that occur due to friction or aerodynamic drag. But if I could get rid of those losses, then actually I've got enough energy there. So the only reason that I add energy to the car is that it fails to hold on to it for long enough. Really, this is a storage tank. And all of these devices have had far less attention to these over here. 
When I was doing my PhD in 1990, I bought my first car, which was, uh, I guess, a mid-1980s model. It was a Peugeot 205 diesel, and it averaged 70 miles per gallon. The current brand leader for green motoring is the Toyota Prius, which averages about 60 miles per gallon. And we are all celebrating it. We've got all those fantastic people with long legs getting out of it in California, making us dream that if we only owned a Toyota Prius, they would get into our car as well. <laughs> but the car I drove as a PhD student was more efficient, and they didn't get into the car at that stage either. Um, what makes a low-carbon car is a small car. If you draw a graph of consumption of cars against their mass, you get a, pretty much a straight line. So we're joking if we're talking about a low-carbon vehicle fleet until we talk about small, lightweight cars. That's what's going to make a big difference. Not efficient engines, not magic supplies of energy coming from somewhere else. A low-carbon car fleet is a set of small cars. We've, I don't think I've heard anybody try to optimise the gas boiler, uh, the domestic gas boiler, as the solution to domestic heating. But there is a lot of discussion, sensible discussion, about shifting to heat pumps rather than gas boilers. But actually, the big opportunity is the buildings themselves. And I think we know that. There are now 9,000 passive houses operating in northern Europe in climates similar to ours. They're not completely passive. They still need some energy, but it's around about 10% of the energy we're using in our buildings today. So if we concentrate on the building envelope rather than the device heating it, that's where we're going to make a big change. So I suppose... The story I'm trying to spin here is to say there isn't a magic alternative to supp supply. The conventional devices that we've already optimised don't have much space left, but there's a great deal of space to make the systems in which we use that final form of energy much, much more efficient. We need much less energy to provide the benefits that we want to take from it. If only we accepted uh, a change to the systems that we use. And I think that's the story I'm going to move on to in talking about materials. I gave examples about the car and the buildings, but in the middle here, roughly a third of the world's energy is used in industry. And when we started looking at this, we realised that that was quite a difficult sector to understand because industry makes primarily, um, or a lot of the energy in industry is used to make intermediate goods, which are only later converted to final goods that we ourselves buy. In fact, much of industrial um, output is bought by companies rather than individuals. So it's difficult to get a handle on that. So instead of looking at energy, we're flipping over here to look at um, CO2 emissions, CO2 equivalent emissions to account for the non-carbon uh, dioxide gases. And in 2008, which is when this data was taken, uh, we emitted around about 44 gigatons of CO2 uh, due to human activity, the first 16 gigatons of which is due to agriculture and land use change. And the solution space for those are different enough, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to limit myself to energy and process-related uh, emissions. And you can see very helpfully that we have about a third of the emissions arising from the use of buildings, a third from the use of vehicles, and just over a third from industry, which makes buildings, makes vehicles, and makes the equipment used in industry, and then makes the appliances and other goods which fit into here. So industry is actually the largest of those big segments over there, and it's still difficult to get a handle until you look a little bit deeper and discover that within industry, actually nearly all of industrial emissions are used to make materials. They're not used to make products. And just five materials, steel and cement, paper, plastic and aluminium, account for 56% of all industrial emissions. So we said, let's focus on those. Let's just take those five materials and see if we can come up with a way of cutting emissions by a factor of two by 2050 within these five materials. And if we can identify those strategies, then maybe they're going to translate into some of these uh, other sectors as well. Now, in fact, because my background was in the metals industry, we limited ourselves mainly to steel and aluminium. As you can see, steel and cement are the two big ones. But um, we're going to focus mainly on steel and aluminium, and I hope that what you see will, uh, you'll be able to translate into other materials as we work through this. So, can we halve emissions associated with steel and aluminium by the year 2050? 
And obviously, if we're going to answer that question, I can't just look at the steel industry itself. I've got to look at where steel is being used. So this graphic, which is, I think, typical of the very high-quality graphics available in this book, which is on sale on Amazon for £21, and as David said, is also available free online at withbotheyesopen.com. Um, this graphic shows roughly where steel and aluminium end up. The size of the picture is in proportion to the fraction of use, and you can see that a half of steel is used in construction, um, around about three quarters of that in buildings and a quarter in infrastructure. Then uh, another segment is used in making equipment, the things that industry uses to make stuff. Uh, another section, about a sixth, is used to make vehicles, and about a sixth is used to make final goods. So half is construction, and then three major other sectors, which are industrial equipment, vehicles, and final goods. With aluminium, it's a similar story, but less in construction and more in packaging. So I need to be aware of this whole range of products that we're making with the materials if I'm going to start looking for big-scale solutions. But unfortunately, I also need to worry about demand because we know we want to halve emissions, or I'm going to use that as a reference for the talk. We want to halve emissions by 2050. But the world isn't going to stay still. So what's going to happen to our demand for these two metals? Well, this, these graphs all relate to steel. And they tell an interesting story. This is the production of steel in kilograms per person per year in a set of developed countries. And what you can see is that as countries become richer, they increase their steel output up to the point that they become rich enough either to elect Mrs. Thatcher or to decide that it would be better if poor people did that nasty, dirty industry of steel making and they then ship it offshore. So Mrs. Thatcher was elected around about here since when the UK steel output has halved. However, our output of steel isn't a very good indicator of our responsibility because what really matters is the steel that we're causing to be made by our purchasing. And it turns out that since Mrs. Thatcher's activities, our demand for steel has grown. We've, we're making more of it in other countries, but we're still causing it to be made. So we're still, to a large extent, responsible for emissions associated with steel. And it turns out that we can find out something rather interesting about this by looking not at production, but at stock. Um, this is a pattern in several different developed countries showing how their stock of steel grows as they become richer. And this is over around about a 100-year period. And as you can imagine, the data requirement for this is fiendish. So this is from a research group in Trondheim, who are our partners, who almost, uh, this is their major output of a, a large group of them trying to understand where steel is. And the pattern that you can see to an approximation is that our demand for steel leads, keeps growing till we have a stock of 10 tonnes of steel per person. And roughly all of Europe, the US, Canada and Japan has around about 10 tonnes of steel per person. And that's buried in our buildings, our infrastructure, in our vehicles, and so on. Um, on average, we are in the UK keeping our stock for 20 years. We keep our buildings for an average of 40 years, our cars for about 15, and other products for less than that. So the average lifetime of steel is 20 years. And if you think that we've got a, a stock of 10 tonnes of steel, um, then our annual demand is 500 kilograms, or half a tonne, so that we turn it over every 20 years. Um, and roughly that's right. Our consumption of steel in the UK is about 500 kilograms, or looking at you as a slender audience, so around about nine times your body weight. Uh, every single one of you is causing that amount of steel to be made every year just to keep maintaining the demands that you have from steel. Well, now, if we assume that developing countries follow a similar trajectory to ours, this gives us a basis for forecasting. We know our demand to maintain our 10 tonnes of stock per person. So if China's stock builds up, at the moment China's at about 3 tonnes per person, which is a slightly illusory number, I think, because actually in the cities, China is very close to 10 tonnes per person, but in the rural areas, China is very close to 0 tonnes per person. So when we talk about China, I think cities against urban, uh, rural areas is important. But China's at about 3 tonnes uh, per person. If it grows to 10 tonnes, and if India grows... Uh, at a similar but later stage, it gives us a basis for saying how much steel we're going to need. And the top line here is our forecast of global steel demand to 2050. 
And roughly in line with what I said about energy earlier on, you can see that our anticipated demand in 2050 is double uh, what we need now. The graph also makes an important point about recycling. The blue line here is our history of making steel by recycling. I'll show some more numbers in a minute, but recycling steel takes about half the energy per tonne of uh, final product compared to making it from ore. So it's a good thing, and we should recycle as much as we can, and actually we do. Because steel's magnetic, it's relatively easy to get out of the waste stream, and we're very effective at collecting it and recycling it. But our trouble is there just isn't enough of it. While the world's demand is growing, there isn't the stock of steel available for us to make the whole of our needs by recycling. At the moment, we can meet about a third of our needs by recycling, and by the year 2050, we'll be up to about half. But we can't do more than that because there just won't be enough of the stock available. So our challenge is now we're going to try and halve emissions by the year 2050, assuming that the demand for steel output doubles over that time. For aluminium, we have to assume that it's going to grow slightly faster because we're seeing a bit of a switch from steel to aluminium in cars at the moment. So the aluminium industry has long tried to take over some of steel uh, in order to promote the benefits of lightweight cars. Now, actually, cars aren't getting any lighter. The point of switching to an aluminium-bodied car is that you can get even more auxiliary uh, motors in for air conditioning and um, uh, other features. Uh, I am... Um, very fond of Jaguar because they've supported our work and they're good partners, but I think they would not mind me pointing out that their recent advert for their aluminium-bodied sports car comes with a built-in in-seat back massager, um, which, of course, you need on the school run, and the weight benefit of switching to aluminium is eclipsed by the new and excessive number of electric motors that have been added in uh, to the vehicle. So... What we want to do is to look ahead and say, can we anticipate halving emissions while we double demand? And we need a little bit of a methodology for this. So rather like my map of global energy that I started with, here is a map of global steel. Now, this is a wonderful picture, and many people, having seen this, have realised that they need to wallpaper their room with it in order to uh, learn to live with it. The picture shows the flow of steel each year uh, coming from iron ore or coming from scrap, running through the steel industry, the blast furnace, uh, the oxygen furnace, casting into the rolling mills, and then to the stock products that the steel industry makes here. So coil and plate and tube and bar. These are the products that the steel industry makes. But if you're like me, and you may or may not be, you may not have in your bedroom a coil of steel uh, strip because it's an intermediate good. We use it in order then to move on and make products so this enormous spaghetti here represents downstream manufacturing and construction in order to make the products that we've already highlighted, construction, vehicles, industrial equipment, and other goods. We can already get a few hints that there may be some space to play here. Firstly, um, I told you about recycling. At the moment, uh, there is recycling, roughly a third of the total, so recycling is about half the height of the iron ore line. But do you notice that that line there is the end-of-life scrap, that steel taken out of uh, end-of-use products. But this line is the return loop from the industry itself. We return a quarter of all the steel made each year, never gets out of the factory, but is in this perpetual recycling loop because it's cut off during production. Um, I'll talk more about that later on, but if you imagine cutting a car body panel out of a strip of steel then because cars aren't made out of hexagonal shapes, they don't tessellate very well. So if you cut out a car door panel, then you index the sheet along, then you've created a great deal of waste uh, while you do it. And that's what's coming around here. So uh, for the world as a whole, we're making 200 kilograms of steel for every person on the planet. That's every single person. As I said, it's 500 per person in the UK. But 50 kilograms of steel per person on the planet, roughly our own body weight, is in a happy loop here being recycled perpetually. And it's great because it's green, and we all celebrate doing things that are green, um, but we're not really getting much of a benefit from it. Now, I've got a map of flows there, so if I look ahead, I can try and imagine how those flows might change, how demand might change, more availability of scrap here, what we might do with ore. But I can impose on top of it uh, some idea of the process energy or emissions that are used in the main processes of steelmaking. 
So here are the energy intensive upstream liquid metal processes going through casting and rolling and so on, and then eventually downstream manufacturing. So that gives me a little way of looking forwards to 2050. I'm going to ask the question in two ways. Firstly, I'm going to look ahead with one eye open. That's the punchy reason for the title of this book I may have mentioned earlier, which is on Amazon. Um, uh, If we could make these processes four times more efficient, we've solved the problem. So if we can make steel using a quarter of the emissions per unit steel that we currently use, then we can allow demand to double and we will have uh, met our our halving of emissions. But if not, then I can also explore changing the flow of steel. I can ask, can I modify the flow of steel through the world system? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look ahead in those two ways. But we're going to try and do it not in the ivory tower, but connected to real uh, businesses. We got the funding for this project um, with the support of 20 companies, a few of whom are represented here, um, and... I think that has worked very well as a way of us trying to formulate a set of ideas, propose a set of studies with the partner companies, then we've done case studies with them, we've written them up, they've told us why we were being naive, we've tried to take that into account, and we've published a string of reports on the way to try and ensure that what we were doing had as much commercial reality as we could achieve. Sometimes when you work with a research group, you're not fully in control of everything. So when I saw this diagram before it appeared in the book, it was a rather uh, boring engineering diagram of the supply chain of businesses involved in the steel and aluminium industry. And by the time it appeared in the book, it had turned into this tree. And I understand that the concept is that the world's metal is flowing up the trunk of the steel industry and then flowering out into the branches of the end-use sectors, then falling to the ground as leaves for recycling. Uh, It's a green image to give you that right feeling again. Uh, I'm trying to at least mention that there's a very broad range of businesses involved in this, and we've done our best to make contact with them all as part of our work. But the two charts over here say something important as we look ahead to the motivation for change. The top one tells you where does the income of the global steel industry come from. And so the thick line on the left is all money flowing into the steel industry, And the lines over here are spending by downstream sectors buying steel. Not surprisingly, the four big lines are construction, equipment, vehicles and goods. Much more interesting is the question of where does the construction industry spend its money? When you buy a new office block, as I'm sure many of you have done, where did the money eventually go? And when we look at that, then of course a large part of it stays within the construction industry due to subcontracting. But as we chase all of the purchasing round the, uh, the loops of the economy, it turns out that only about 4% of all of the money spent on a new building goes to the steel industry. So the price of steel, or the cost of the steel in your new building, is around about 4%. And that tells you something very interesting about the motivation of that industry. If we imagine that the energy price doubled, which is way beyond any carbon price that's being discussed... The price of steel would go up by a third. Energy is about a third of the costs of making steel. So that would apparently change demand. But the final product that uses the steel would only go up by, um, the price would only go up by 1%, which is in the noise. That's uh, not a very sensitive uh, trigger for change behaviour. So I think what I take from that is that pricing, particularly carbon pricing, may not be a very strong signal to the people who are the final determinants of demand for steel. We'll come back to that in a moment. So, with one eye open, can we make this industry four times more uh, efficient? Can we reduce the emissions to a quarter uh, by optimising the processes? Well, if you think about that for a picosecond, you know the answer has to be no, because here are the costs of steel production and aluminium production, In both cases, a third of the costs of making the metal is energy purchasing. So guess what's been the top motivation of every manager in those industries for the last 150 years? Well, of course, what they've been trying to do is to make the industries as energy efficient as they can. And the story's here. Here are the the energy intensities of steel making and aluminium making. The steel one, I slightly regret, it has a combination of recycled and primary production in. Uh, But the aluminium one is just primary. And it shows you over 30 years 
that the aluminium industry has made progress in the energy per tonne of aluminium produced, but the progress has reached a plateau because they've done it so well. And in fact, since about 2008, the energy intensity of aluminium making has started to rise because we've used up the best sources of bauxite in the world, and we're now going to having to use slightly less uh, concentrated bauxite in order to make aluminium. You can see here that there is still a variation between average plant and best practice. So when we talk about energy uh, efficiency in industry, what we're really talking about is closing that gap between average performance and best practice. But it's very difficult indeed to get best practice down very further, very much further, because there is a theoretical minimum to how far you can go. Um, the theoretical minimum requires more chemical knowledge than I have to explain, but if you've got a litre of water at room temperature and you want to boil it, it doesn't matter what the economic incentive is. There is a limit to how much energy you have to use to boil the water, and it's exactly the same in making steel or aluminium. So at our most optimistic, we can say that there's 20 to 30% of energy efficiency left in the industry, but there's certainly not 75%. So you might ask, are there new processes that we're going to uh, create steel and aluminium in a new way? Well, we looked for those and we couldn't find them. Could we power um, the, these industries from windmills or, or solar cells or biofuel? Well, conceptually we could, but the scale of implementation is enormous and probably other sectors are more likely to uh, get hold of that energy when it's um, provided. Um, and so on. So we, we looked at every option. Can we capture heat better? Could we even consider CCS, that comfort blanket of energy policy, which has yet to be implemented anywhere, but we, the International Energy Agency until last year was forecasting that a quarter of all the world's emissions would be captured and stored by 2050, which I find completely impossible to believe. But let's believe that we'll do 10% of that as well. And when we add it all up, what we could find was that by 2050, if our emissions here are currently the green line, if we do nothing, the emissions will go up to around about where the blue area is. And if we do everything, a concerted international effort to pursue every efficiency that anybody has ever identified, and we implement them all perfectly and globally, we could bring the emissions back to being around about where we are now. That would be a great achievement. And, of course, my forecasting over a period of 40 years is very approximate. The numbers are... We have very little certainty about what these numbers are going to be. But I think we can say with complete certainty that there is no chance that we can create an industry that will produce double the output with half the emissions just by energy and process efficiency measures. And the same is true for aluminium. So, apparently, we're stuck. Apparently, we can't go any further because we can't make the whole process more efficient, so we're doomed. But what we saw at the beginning was that with our map of flow and our map of processes, there's a whole different set of options if we look at modifying the flow of material through the system. And we found six options that we could explore. Three of them are looking at these return loops. So can we reduce the amount of material going round in these loops Maybe we could divert some of the scrap and use it in a different way. Or maybe we could find a different way to take old products apart in order to use the material again without melting it. So those are all to try and reduce the, uh, the cycle of scrap going around the loop. Or maybe I could influence demand overall. Maybe we could design lighter products. Or we could keep goods for longer so that once our stock stabilises, in the UK if we kept our stock for 40 years rather than 20 we would halve our demand for new steel. Or maybe we could use the products that we have more intensively so we didn't need so many products. So for each of these strategies, we developed with our consortium of partners a set of case studies and so on as I, I worked through. And what I'd like to show you is a summary of the, the key lessons that we picked up uh, from this. So firstly, can we use less by design? If you've wandered around um, London, certainly very visibly in Cambridge at the moment, we've just changed the planning regulations in Cambridge so you can move up to a six-storey building rather than a four-storey building. So we're very busy knocking down our buildings and replacing them with buildings with the same footprint that are two storeys taller. Um, if you look at the buildings, then they look like Meccano kits. They have um, frames often made with steel, um, sometimes it's uh, cement platforms, but you can see sticks of steel, I-beams, uh, horizontally and vertical columns. We have a frame into which we then 
position the floors and the ceilings and the rest of the building. And like these beams over our head here, these uh, beams are a constant depth. Now, every engineer in the world will tell you that those beams should not be a constant depth because the tendency to bend is greater in the middle. If they're supported here and here, they're going to bend in the middle. So they should have a deeper section in the middle and less deep at the edge. And you can compare an optimal design with uh, constant thickness with an optimal design with more material in the middle. And what we find is that if we had a, a design that was a bit more of this kind of shape, we could take out a third of the steel with no loss of service. The user would be unaware that we'd made a difference. Um, it would be slightly more awkward to construct because um, we'd have to think about how to hang the ceiling around there. Um, but we could take a third of the metal out of the building design without the user being aware of it. And when we looked at a whole series of other products, deep sea pipeline, features of the car, reinforcement bar, and food cans, we found, roughly speaking, from a design point of view, in use, products could use a third less material than they currently use. Now, the reasons that we're not doing that, there are barriers that stop us from saving material. And roughly, they're about the economies of scale. Materials are cheap, labor is expensive, so we try and do things in a way which minimizes our use of labor, even if that means that we use more material. But the factor of a third is really important when we've seen how difficult it is to make any improvement with the process and energy intensity of the industry. If we could simply use less material, it's a far bigger abatement strategy than anything we've discussed so far in the talk. As we've gone on with this, in fact, we've found that overdesign is even stronger these are rather idealised designs that we're looking at here. But when we look in practice at the way that buildings are built, economically it's rational to do what the construction industry calls rationalisation, to simplify the design because it's cheaper to construct, to manage the building site if you have fewer different components on the site. And the cost of that is again a great excess use of material. So it seems to us from our data at the moment, and we're working very hard to understand it better, that we could build our buildings with around about a half the amount of material that we're currently using, with no loss of performance, no loss of safety whatsoever. It would cost more because we would need more labour to do it. But as an abatement strategy, that's now, if it really is a half, that's equivalent to everything I can do by optimising the industry. So we could use less, that's clear. What about these yield losses? I don't know if um, you've ever made jam tarts or mince pies, but one of the frustrations of making mince pies is that your circular cutter, when placed on the pastry, cuts out beautiful circles but leaves behind a skeleton of other pastry. Now, pastry is something which you can recycle, although I understand from the cooks with whom I live that the quality goes down as you uh, recycle. So with one of my daughters, we did an important scientific experiment where we took one of the Allwood family pastry cutters and a hammer, and we changed it into a hexagon. And we then cut hexagonal jam tarts out of our sheet of pastry. A hexagon is the highest order regular polygon that tessellates perfectly. And we had no yield losses apart from around the edges, and we designed our sheet of pastry rather carefully to make this work and then did a completely neutral and independent trial in the research lab with one plate of circular jam tarts and one plate of hexagonal jam tarts. And I can tell you that hexagonal jam tarts are very much more popular with end users uh, than <laughs> circular ones. Um, can we learn anything from that? Well, we did a, a big study looking at a set of products where we started at the final product and walked backwards through the industry to understand where this material was being cut off. With I-beams, these products that um, we build buildings from, actually we're pretty good because they're made in extremely long lengths and we do cut them to length pretty effectively. But with things made out of sheet, then we cut off on average a half of all the metal between liquid metal and make it into a product. We lose a half. So the Toyota Prius, which is 1.3 tonnes, contains about a tonne of steel. But to make it, you need two tonnes of steel because you're going to throw away a tonne on the way. Now, you can imagine why that is. The car door doesn't tessellate very well. You can see it's not a regular hexagon. But also, it's got a whacking great hole in the middle there. Now, actually, if you thought about it, if you were making cake, you would use that. You would make a sub-cake using that uh, piece in the middle. The industry isn't configured to do that at the moment. So there are some simple things we can do, learning lessons from the clothing and textiles industry, who are very good at cutting up sheets of fabric to make all the components of a garment. Um, but 
we could also start informing designers about the way that their choices on the shapes of the component influence the yield, the amount of metal I'm eventually going to have to throw away. So this is a technology opportunity. Many of the things that we've looked at are systems opportunities. But here, by technology changes, we could cut down significantly on these yield losses. Um, the aircraft industry famously um, produces primarily scrap aluminium and as a small byproduct makes aeroplanes. Um, we'll uh, leave that till later. Um, this, I don't know if you can see over the table, this is an arena where we got to know uh, the joint performances of Mr. Bean and James Bond in the summer. But it's a rather nice icon for another reason, which is that it was um, designed with a very special circular roof truss to hold up the roof. And if you imagine making a circular truss out of tubes, you need a rather complicated tube, which isn't quite straight. So it was designed originally to have tailor-made tubes uh, that would form that truss. And the company building it became concerned that it would take too long to do so. Um, and by a series of chances, I don't know quite how this worked out, around about that time, somebody who was installing a gas pipe in the North Sea realised that they had overordered the gas pipe that was required to connect their gas uh, well to the land. And they sent 26,000 tonnes of unwanted gas pipe to Cardiff to be recycled. So the uh, gas pipes were diverted and the truss redesigned. And what you saw there was, in fact, unwanted, unused scrap gas pipes and not the tailor-made structure. It's a little bit of a complicated story to make a point, but you can see that there are opportunities for avoiding melting scrap if we could find, if we could find a way of matching its supply with its demand. The last, well, two big strategies I want to talk about um, to finish... Can we reuse metal without melting? In particular, in construction, can we reuse steel without melting it? This graph shows the history of the use of steel in construction in the UK. And you can see that around about 1970, we began quite a rapid shift away from concrete-framed buildings towards more steel-framed buildings. And remembering the lifespan of buildings is somewhere between 30 and 40 years. If we shift that curve forwards... What it suggests to us is that we're about to see a supply surge of unwanted steel frame buildings being taken down. And as we drove around the UK, we found that the entire supply chain of companies involved in reusing steel exists. Here is the UK's largest stockist of secondhand steel in Oldham. Here's a scientific instrument used in Cambridge in this case to remove what will shortly become Microsoft's new uh, office building on the road to our station. Uh, here's a company in Suffolk that takes down old single-storey portal frame sheds, refurbishes them and then sells them with some adjustment to the next customer. And here's the headquarters of the British Construction Steelwork Association uh, made out of scrap steel that was on the site when they bought the land. So we can do this. We know how to build new buildings out of old steel. And steel, although it's got stronger in the last 40, 40 to 50 years, hasn't become stiffer uh, its stiffness is the same as it was. So although in some cases strength is the determining uh, factor that tells you how much steel you have to use, in many others it's stiffness that matters. Steel doesn't degrade in use unless there's a fire in the building, which is relatively rare. So potentially we've got a supply of energy-free steel, and rather than recycling it, raising it to 1,500 degrees, casting it and rolling it, we could adopt some of these uh, strategies and get it back into use. Now, that seems to us such a high priority. We're trying to work uh, very hard on getting some demonstrators of this. One of the issues we have to solve is about the way that old steel is certified so that the insurance industry can accept the risk on it. Um, and a simpler issue, uh, but one which requires unpicking, is that at the moment a building remains empty for around about two years before it's replaced. But during that period, a whole series of contractual issues are being solved so a new uh, tenant is found, maybe a new owner for the land, and a design is commissioned and planning permission is sought and a client is sought. And only when that whole set is put together is the old building demolished. And at that point, it has to be demolished as fast as possible because otherwise there would be a loss of revenue to the final uh, owner. However, the building's been empty for two years. And as far as we can tell from our cost numbers, it would already be profitable to take the building down by deconstruction rather than demolition, if only we could separate out that contract on the new building. So if we could value the clean site 
in a different way from the way that we value the used site, then we would be able to bring this about. So we believe. So we're working hard on trying to get a demonstrator of that. Um, Long life products. I think this is where it seems like um, however hard we try to talk as if we're doing science, what we're really talking about is what Granny would have told us to do anyway. Um, When we choose to, we can keep our products going for a long time when we give them heritage status. uh, And when we don't give them heritage status, we can get rid of them very quickly. Um, But most products are not thrown away because they're broken. It turns out that mainly it's only infrastructure that we replace when it's worn out. Uh, So rail track, for example, must be replaced when the surface is worn. Um, But cars we throw away for other reasons than that they're broken. And the same with most other products. In fact, we found that um, only infrastructure is thrown away because it's degraded. And the two main reasons that we replace what we own are either because our needs have changed, so a sports car for a couple that have just got married would need a larger car, or because it's inferior. Now, on the day that I took the first copy of the book, uh, which is available on Amazon (laughs) Home, um, our fridge broke. Our fridge was made by a company called LG, and you should never buy any product from LG. They're rubbish. Uh, We'd owned the fridge for eight years, and on the day I took the book home, it broke. So, of course, I read the chapter on long-life products in the book and realised that I should repair it. So we called the repairman in, and the reason that it had broken was that there was a small pinhole leak somewhere in the heat exchanger at the back, and the cooling gas had uh, escaped... But we had no mechanism to find the gap because LG, which is a rubbish company, had made it badly. Now, I was so provoked by this, I looked a bit more into fridges. And it turns out that our problem was just because LG is a very poor manufacturer of fridges. Um, The real reason that British fridges mainly fail is because the compressor fails. The compressor is the electric motor that drives the pump. Now, when it fails, it's not the compressor, it's the bearing. But actually, it's not the bearing that's failed. It's the seal that holds the lubricant in the bearing that has failed, allowing the lubricant out and the bearing is worn out and then the compressor is worn out. That seal has a value of less than a tenth of a penny. So we could design products in a way that we could keep them going much longer. We did a study on uh, rolling mills, and it turns out that virtually every rolling mill that's ever been made is still operating because they're a rather open structure the big structural element, the frames and the rolls, can survive. And the control systems and the accessories are accessible so you can replace them. So we could move to a design mode where we uh, design products that were repairable. Uh, We have a problem with the economies of scale, of course, doing it, because then we have to repair them wherever they are rather than having specialised labour in the same location. Um, But we could choose to do it, and as an abatement strategy, very obviously it has enormous potential because once stocks have stabilised, if I double the lifetime, I halve the demand for industrial output, not necessarily halving the demand for labour. So I think this one has got real legs as a policy strategy. Finally, what about final demand? I dangerously get to the end of anything I know about when I start talking about happiness, but there's a fantastic group of people... Uh, in economics, looking about the link between well-being and wealth, essentially showing that as countries get richer up to some level, the people self-report as being uh, increasingly happy, and beyond some threshold, then that ceases to be the case. And I think we know that. If we were to rank our friends by wealth and rank them by personal contentment or happiness, we wouldn't see a strong correlation between them. Slightly nearer to engineering, we don't use our products anything like nearly uh, as much as they're capable of being used. In the UK, we own one car for every two people. We drive it for four hours per week on average with one and a half people in it. So our cars are unused to about 99% of their potential capacity. Now, if we chose to have half the number of cars and to drive them with double the number of people in for eight hours a week each, our journey times would all shorten and we would all be a £1,000 per year better off. But we prefer not to. Um, So, fortunately, in these centres that David uh, mentioned that have been announced today, uh, two of those are about the sociology of consumption. Uh, In my background as an engineer, I just don't have the skills to understand that. But behind a lot of what I've said, people's choices 
would drive these strategies almost immediately if we told the suppliers that that's what we preferred, rather than telling them that we'd like it, but only if they produce it at the same cost as the cheapest rubbish LG equivalent on the market. <laughs> so we've got six new strategies, and to try and evaluate those, we created a, a graphic mixing desk of sustainability. So for all of the products that I showed in the catalogue at the beginning, we created a set of sliders which allowed us to move from the current level of material use or the current degree of reuse or current lifespan up to what we thought was credible physical maximum of what we could achieve. And then we set about moving the sliders on our mixing desk to find out what we could achieve. So again, with great uh, caution about the accuracy of any forecast, um, if we start from where we ended, having already implemented all the energy and emissions efficiency strategies that we mentioned with one eye open, then roughly I've moved all of my steel sliders halfway in these six strategies of material efficiency, using less material to dis deliver the same service, and I've reached the target that we set about. Uh, with aluminium, I've got to move them the whole way because we're expecting demand for aluminium to grow faster. The forecast doesn't matter, and the degree of whether it's more material efficiency and less energy efficiency doesn't matter at all either. But what does matter is that we are not going to create a low-carbon industrial system solely by focusing on the energy use in industry. Uh, if we want a low-carbon future in the industrial sector, we have to use less material. And we've got a whole series of strategies and opportunities here to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. We have five minutes for questions. I'd like to uh, encourage people to be brief. Please stand up and please use the microphone. We'll take questions in twos or threes. First, the gentleman in the suit here. And a second question from another hand, please. Yes, at the front here in the blue shirt. And then our third question will be uh, here on the second row from the, the front. Yes, go ahead. Thank I'm you. David White of ACOM. Um, a couple of things struck me. One was the, um, you, I think in the long term, you have a, co uh, a conflict between optimising designs of structural components on one hand and the ability to reuse on the other. Reuse is most um, yeah. e easily done when you have standardised sizes, which is the opposite to customised sizes. So I think that's a problem. And this is just a far idea which just struck me. 3D printing is becoming quite a big thing, but limited to plastics. And I did wonder whether it would be possible in the future to link the steelworks to, say, the car factory. So you have 3D printing of key big components, so you'd reduce those yield losses. Thank you. Now, John. Uh, uh, thank you for an excellent talk. Uh, you mentioned several times that uh, some of these industries are already driven to doing the optimum thing by natural economic forces. Uh, and you were talking all along with a backdrop of reducing carbon. I agree with the outcomes that you've put up, but don't you think we're only going to go down that route if, in fact, carbon is priced? And what do you think is the possibility of that occurring? Thank you. And here. Uh, Nigel Gilbert from the University of Surrey. Um, thanks for a, a wonderful talk, uh, indeed. T two little points. Um, first of all, your fridge. Uh, if uh, you're not careful, if you uh, replace your, your, your fridge, don't replace your fridge, you build it so that it's like a tank, uh, you may end up with a fridge which is actually energy inefficient as compared with the fridge that you would buy now. Uh, and so one should be looking for some kind of optimum, but not necessarily the longest life. Um, the second point is that uh, in, in, in your talk, you often referred to the idea of uh, one, uh, one firm or one industry taking uh, materials from others, uh, including waste and scrap. And this uh, it sounds, in principle, a really good idea. I just wanted to make the point that in practice it may be extremely difficult. There's a lot of information which has to pass between companies in order to make that viable. Uh, it's a process... Uh, I, I, as you will know, called industrial symbiosis. And uh, it turns out that that's one of those ideas, I think, mm. that sounds really good, but in practice is horrendously difficult. Thank you. Over to you, Julian. 
Thanks very much. I think that was five um, <laughs> questions. So there were two trade-offs mentioned there. Um, optimization versus reuse and uh, long life versus technology improvements. And that's right. There are other trade-offs as well. Um, in those cases, I think the answer to the optimization versus reuse is, firstly, let's not throw away optimization before we've even started because uh, we've seen up a new big opportunity here. But secondly, if we can optimise around a standardised architecture, then we could have a big opportunity. We're doing a study with a supermarket at the moment uh, where we are trying to have a standardised grid and optimise the materials within that grid. You'd think they do that already, but architects go around to supermarket sites and go and have feelings. And when an architect... You and I know that a supermarket should be built on a six-metre grid. It's obvious, because they all look like they're about six metres. But they're not, because the architect goes to Sheffield and thinks, 5.9, can't be six. So actually, supermarkets are not yet standardised, and they should be. And then within that frame, we could optimise. I think we wouldn't be pushing the boat of a much wider fragment of the construction industry too much if we standardised more. Uh, if we had standardised column spacings and then we allowed the external envelope of the building to move. Um, the use versus embodied one, of course, is absolutely right. And the question just depends on where we're at with the rate of improvement of use phase energy. Fridges uh, declined badly in the, uh, up till mid-1970s as we all went for larger fridges that were badly designed. Um, they've then become very much more efficient, apparently driven by the labelling systems, which have been very effective and have to be renewed because everybody was getting to the top level of the scale. But the, they're approaching a plateau now. So I think with fridges, we can say with some confidence they should last longer. And actually, the car industry has had us foxed because they claim exactly what you said, that we should buy more cars to get more efficiency. But we're buying larger, bigger cars, larger, heavier cars, and they are not yet more efficient than they were 20, 30 years ago. Um, so there is a trade-off. It's absolutely right. I guess combining the two, what we're hoping for is that we might come up with a modular design where we can replace the component that's causing the inefficiency rather than having to replace the whole lot. Um, 3D printing we looked at very carefully, and, um, and really they ought to get together with LG. 3D printing is a complete pain if you work in this area because it sounds like what James Bond would do. And on the whole, the funding agency pursues James Bond. So if you can come up with an image of somebody making, uh, I don't know, the, the statue of David in, in Florence made out of your low-grade plastic, then you can then persuade the government this is going to scale up into a multi-billion pound business. And it just isn't because it only applies to materials that fuse from powder and you can only get the properties of a certain number of materials when you start in very small uh, droplets and add them up. The steel industry uses all this energy partly because you have to take steel through a series of heating and deformation cycles to get the properties that we need. So I'm afraid 3D printing isn't the magic answer that its proponents would have us believe. Um, the uh, waste versus input material, you're absolutely right. I think our preference is always going to be to generate less waste, and it does seem like there's a lot of opportunity to do that. We found one of the other businesses on my slide was one that's uh, operating in Kettering called Abbey Steel, who's a 30-year-old business who buy the skeletons from Toyota, Nissan, and Honda, so the leftover bits after they've cut out the car body parts. And in a Victorian industry, they hand them to a group of 16-year-old boys on work experience uh, who have manual guillotines and cut squares out of them. And they sell the squares to uh, companies like MK Electric. I don't know if you can see the switch in the wall there, but it's mounted to be flush with the surface. So in the wall is a small metal box which it screws onto. And MK Electric use a lot of ex-Toyota material to make those. So in that case, there is a very simple supply chain you're dead right. It only applies in a small number of groups, and I agree entirely about industrial symbiosis. Um, it's a great story, and the number of applications is very limited. So I've left the carbon price to the end, because that's the hardest one. Um, but the logic of the carbon price is that it will somehow permeate through the economy, and this will change all of our choices. Um, what I showed with the idea of cost in construction is that actually a massive carbon price on steel and cement would make a negligible difference to the cost of the building. 
So it would make a difference if there was a bunch of substitute materials that were much lower emissions that were available as a substitute for steel and cement, and there aren't. And that's just because of volume. We're using steel in 200 kilograms per person per, on the planet. We have nothing that we can replace it with. We use steel in replace of wood that we used to have, but we couldn't grow enough wood to replace steel globally. Um, cement, we, the only alternative is stone, and we moved away from stone because it's, um, it was more convenient to go to cement. So, again, I'm off my territory as a learning engineer trying to learn the language and thinking of economi economics. And it's difficult because if you ever say the carbon price is not the mechanism, the economists all jump up and, uh, and make noise. So, in this case, I cannot see the carbon price working. And what I think will work is regulation. Uh, because we already have it. We already have building regulation and building standards. We've got vehicle standards. Uh, so we could regulate not to meet the Euro codes as a minimum, but to meet them as a target. And that would significantly reduce the material use in buildings. Rather than regulating on emissions per vehicle, we could uh, regulate on the vehicle mass. And I think small adjustments to ex existing regulation is going to have a much faster effect than a hypothetical carbon price to be continued. Julian, thank you so much. Uh, this has been an informative, uh, challenging, and nevertheless an optimistic talk, and truly thought-provoking. Thank you so much for a wonderful evening. Thank you.